The scripture reading today to celebrate the church's birthday is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. It's in page 119 of the New Testament of the Pew Bible, if you're interested. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together, gathered together in one place. And suddenly, from the heaven, there came that sound like the rush of violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heavens living in Jerusalem. At this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because one heard them speaking in their own native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Manphilia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken from the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show potence, portents in the heavens above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist, the shun the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. I always kind of wish that Peter would leave out, they, they can't be drunk, it's only nine in the morning. Nobody got up early to drink in Palestine, I guess. Will you pray with me for a moment? Lord, help us to be masters of ourselves so that we might become the servants of others. Take our eyes and see through them. Take our ears and hear with them. Take our minds and think with them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. A couple of pastors were at a preacher's conference about this time of year. And one said to the other, what are you going to preach about Sunday? And the other one responded, well, you know, it's Pentecost, uh, Holy Spirit, and, you know, all that stuff. And the other one said, you know, it doesn't seem like an ordinary day to me. Now, he said, I'm a Presbyterian. And we like things in good order. We even have a book called the Book of Order. We have a book, by the way, called the Book of Discipline. And he said, you know, I opened the book, and there's the story of Pentecost. And the wind blows, and you try to shut the book quickly, but it doesn't work because that spirit gets out into the world and into the church and into people's lives. My uh, wife worked for a fellow at Digital, a good friend of mine named Phil. Phil had a saying that I think a lot of you might know, especially some managers. I don't mind problems, I just don't like surprises. 
Well, that's it's kind of how some people are. And Pentecost kind of rolls over all of that. The word for wind in Hebrew is ruach. It means wind. It also means spirit. When the languages were translated into Greek, the word is noumena, like pneumatic, powerful wind blowing through that enclosed room. And then in, in chapter 24 of Acts, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power. The word is dynamis, like dynamite, a dynamic. There's some powerful words associated with this Pentecost season. The book of Acts begins where the book of Luke lets off. In the, pen, in the story of Pentecost, we hear these story of the wind and the fire. If you wanted to follow along with a sermon, you can use the notes, or you could open the Bible and just open it to Acts. Acts 2 is the story of Pentecost. Acts uh, 8 is one of my favorite stories. Philip is taken up by the Holy Spirit, and he's told to go down to the road that leads to Gaza, Jerusalem's up here on a high mountain in the center of the city. Gaza is a long way south, down toward the desert. And as he's on the way, he meets a fellow uh, in a chariot, a uh, very impressive looking fellow. Uh, he, he is the, uh, the second in command or the, the head of the treasury of the Candace, which is the name the queen of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has been given tall gentleman, probably has a driver, most likely black. And he's reading the book of Isaiah. He's been to Jerusalem. He, he is a, a follower of God. He, he wants to worship. He wants to understand some things. And he says uh, that, I read this, but I don't understand it. I don't know who the prophet is talking about. Is he talking about himself, or is he talking about somebody to come? And Philip says, in effect, may I? He says, of course. And so he steps into the, um, into the chariot with him. Oh, small fun fact, having nothing to do with the sermon. Do you know how wide a railroad track is? That's exactly the width of a Roman chariot, the chariots used in that day. So it, it, it's fairly wide. And so Philip begins to tell uh, the Ethiopian eunuch about the love of God. Now, you have to understand that a eunuch is a person uh, who has perhaps been castrated. He's, he's a given a position of trust. He's the treasurer of the queen. He goes to Jerusalem and they determine somehow that uh, you're a, a eunuch, uh, assistant to the queen. We're so glad that you're here in Jerusalem, but you can't enter the temple. It says in the book of Leviticus that eunuchs can't do that. And so he worships from outside. But Philip says, Jesus came for you. You're part of the family of God. You are of importance to God. You are loved. And the eunuch, they ride along and the eunuch listens. And then he says, here is water, there's a stream. What's to prevent me from being baptized? And Philip says, not a thing. And they go down into the water and he's baptized. And he said, you are part of the family of God. He who has been left out, he who has not a family, he who is uh, in effect discriminated against, <clears throat> is now a person 
with family. It is the family of God. In chapter 10 of Acts, you know the story of Cornelius and Peter. Peter is down uh, on the coast by Caesarea. It's a lovely place, by the way. Uh, And he's living with uh, Simon the Tanner. I think when a lot of people read that, they they wonder, uh, I, I wonder why they put his occupation in. Tanners, because they dealt with dead animals and had to work with the hide, uh, were very often not only uh, regularly unclean, but ceremonially unclean. But Peter was there, which is interesting. Peter, a, a, an Orthodox Jew who follows all the rules, was there with Simon the Tanner. And then he goes up, up to the roof. There's a flat roof there. It's there by the sea, and he looks out. And he's praying, and then it says he, a trance comes over him. And he has a vision of a great sheet from heaven. And it's lowered down in front of Peter, and the voice says, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. And Peter looks and said, well, I would, but there are some things there that are unclean, ritually unclean. I would never do that. And the sheet goes up. And it comes back down again. It says, Peter, arise and kill and eat. And it goes back up. And the Holy Spirit says, some, some men are coming to see you. And Cornelius, who is the head of a Praetorian guard, lives a bit away. And he sends two of his men to find Peter because the Holy Spirit says, Go to Caesarea, send your men. There's a man there named Peter, and you need to hear what he has to say. And so they knock on the door at the same time that Peter's on the edge of the roof and looks down. And these men say, Our master, who is a devout follower of God, is proselyte. He, He believes in God, the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Jews. And uh, they said, we would like you to come uh, to see our master. I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, if a military person of great bearing, two of them come to your door and say, come with us, you would probably go with them. But they're good men. They're kind men. And so they follow there. And they go to... uh, Cornelius' house. Cornelius has gathered his whole family, relatives, anybody he can fit in the place, followers of God, and they await Peter, and Peter comes through the door and and greets him, and the first thing Peter says is interesting. He says, you know, I'm a a practicing Jew, and and we don't usually do this. You know, come into an unbelief, come into somebody's house who, who is not a Jew. I understand you're a believer, but we don't usually do this. And then he has found that he's already walked in. And then he teaches about the word of God. And these people, these Romans, these outsiders, these soldiers, hear the word of God and say what must be due. And Peter says... Repent and believe the gospel that Christ died for you, even you. The outsider, a different uh, ethnic background, uh, different occupations, somebody who is part of the life of the church. Paul was on one of his missionary journeys. He was in Asia Minor. And he wanted to go to Bithynia, which is in the northeast part of what we now call <coughs> um, Turkey. He, he had his mindset that was, he, he knew there were people there who might be believers if only they had uh, the word preached to them. <coughs> and uh, he was, excuse me, <coughs> he wanted to go to Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit said, No. You're not to go to Bithynia, Paul in effect says. 
I've been planning this missionary trip for a long time, and I know there are people who need to hear the word of God in Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit says no. And what it doesn't say, by the way, is that um, Luke joins the party. Luke is one of the most humble people in the world because he comes along and tells the story of Paul and said, they go here and they go there, and, we, and then we, we couldn't go to Bithynia, and so we went to Macedonia. Doesn't even use his name, but the pronoun changes from they to we. And he's prevented to go to Bithynia. He wanted Bithynia. He gets Macedonia, and then he gets Europe, and then he goes to Rome. Are you now where you thought you would be when you were 18? Not usually. All of us have interrupted journeys, places we didn't intend to go, and yet we find ourselves there. You may be at that place now. You may be in a place that you didn't intend to be at. Um, physically, health-wise, geographically, and you might wonder about that. If God was with you to this point in your life, what makes you think he's going to give up on you now? God is a God of second chances. One of my favorite stories about Johann Sebastian Bach is he goes to the church in Leipzig. He's interviewing for a job as the organist, and they have a whole bunch of people. I don't know how many people were there, but I know they in Bach was number three. We want this guy, he didn't want to come. We want the second guy, he didn't want to come. All right, what the heck, we'll take Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> God can use us. The Holy Spirit rides the lame horse and whittles the rotten wood, so says Luther. There was a young man born in Tennessee named uh, William Blois, and uh, he uh, wanted to preach the gospel. He got kind of ill, and he was, uh, thought it would be good to go to a drier place and so moved to Texas. And uh, he got uh, some unwell, and he was told, move to West Texas. How many of you have been to West Texas? Getting, my brother lives in San Antonio. My wife's brother used to live in Phoenix, and we've taken that trip. Going from San Antonio to, to you know, across West Texas isn't a trip, it's a career. But the young pastor, Boyce, he got a, a, a little wagon and rode on that. And wherever there were people, he stopped. And he preached. And some people told him, you know, there's a lot of cowboys and they're a rough sort. And they don't hear the word of the Lord. If you've ever been to West Texas and you've seen the sign, Cowboy Church. Anybody see, see that? Okay, some of you did. Pastor Blois preached, whether there were six or 600, he started preaching above a, a saloon. He wasn't even a Methodist. Methodists are known for preaching above saloons and at the back of the bar. No, John Wesley did that. Charles Wesley did that. They, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody said... To, the, the devil shouldn't have all the good music. <clears throat> so he preached, and that cowboy church exists to this day for a guy who left Tennessee. He, he, wanted to, he wanted to go to China. I left that out. He wanted to be a missionary to China, but he got Texas. <laughs> but God used him powerfully 
in that place. And God can use you powerfully in this place or to all the places to which you go. Amen.